fourth course students. The subject you are going to study is English literature. The aim of studying this subject is to introduce you with the development and stages of English literature in different periods and acquaint you with the famous English writers and their works. The first lecture, uh, the theme of which is English literature of the middle centuries from 5th to 11th, will focus on the following questions. The first, the main and aims of literature, basic literary terms. The second question, characteristics of Anglo-Saxon period from 449 to 1066. The third question is St. Venerable David and his important work Historia Ecclesiastica Gentis Anglorium. And the last question is King Alfred the Great and his contribution to the literature. Literature is very important in the life of every person. We read literature to enjoy it. Enjoyment also includes understanding. Literature is a kind of mirror that enables us to see ourselves better and to understand what we see. Through literature we may better understand how to face our own challenges. The aim of studying English literature is the formation and development of intercultural outlook because English literature is one of the most significant components of English culture. Competent English teachers should know and be able to use the knowledge of English culture in his future professional activity. During the course of studying literature, we may need to know basic terms. The main literary terms are genre. It means a particular style or type, especially of works of art or literature. Style, a manner of writing that is characteristics of a particular writer, historical period or type of literature. Literature, writings that are valued as works of art, especially fiction, drama and poetry. Drama, a kind of literature, a written play for the theater, radio and TV. Literary terms refer to the technique, style and formatting used by the writers and speakers to masterfully emphasize, embellish or strengthen their compositions. Literary terms also include powerful figurative language that writers use to summon emotion running from guilt to anger to bliss and to allow us to see the world in new and magical ways. Such a study of literature as that for which the present course is designed includes two purposes, contributing to a common end. In the first place, the student must gain some general knowledge of the conditions out of which English literature has come into being as a whole, and that during its successive periods, that is of the external facts of one sort or another, without which it cannot be understood. This means chiefly tracing in a general way, from period to period, the social life of the nation and getting some acquaintance with the lives of the more important authors. In principal thing, however, is the direct study of the literature itself. This study, in turn, should aim first at an understanding of the literature as an expression of the author's views of life and of their personalities and especially as a portrayal and interpretation of the life of their periods. All life as they have seen it, it should aim further at an appreciation of, of each literary work as a product of fine art, appealing with peculiar power both to our minds and to our emotions, not least to the sense of beauty and the whole higher nature. Characteristics of Anglo-Saxon period from 449 to 1066 the process by which Britain became England was a part of the long agony which transformed the Roman Empire into modern Europe. In the 4th century AD, the Angles, Saxons and Jutes began to harry the southern and eastern shores of Britain, where the Romans were obliged to maintain a special military establishment against them. But early in the 5th century, the Romans, hard-pressed even in Italy by other barbarian invaders, withdrew all their troops and completely abandoned Britain.
Not long thereafter, and probably before the traditional date of 449, the Jutes, Angles, and Saxons began to come in large bands with a deliberate purpose of permanent settlement. Their conquest very different in its methods and results from that of the Romans, may roughly be said to have occupied a hundred and fifty or two hundred years. The early invading uh, hordes fixed themselves at various points on the eastern and southern shore and gradually fought their way inland, and they were constantly augmented by new arrivals. In general, the Angles settled in the east and north, and the Saxons in the south, while the less numerous Jutes, the first to come in Kent, soon ceased to count in the movement. In this way, there naturally came into existence a group of separate and rival kingdoms, which then they were not busy with the Britons, were often at war with each other. Their number varied somewhat from time to time as they were united or divided, but on the whole seven figured most prominently whence comes the traditional name, the Saxon Heptarchy, Seven Kingdoms. The resistance of the Britain to the Anglo-Saxon advance was often brave and sometimes temporarily successful. Early in the 6th century, for example, they won at Mont Baden. In the south, a great victory, later connected in tradition with the legendary name of King Arthur, which for many years gave them security from further aggressions. But in the long run, their racial defects proved fatal. They were unable to combine in permanent steady union, and tribe by tribe the newcomers drove them slowly back, until early in the 7th century the Anglo-Saxons were in possession of nearly all the what is now England. The exceptions being the regions all along the west coast, including what has ever seen been known as Wales. The spread of Christianity was an important event in the life of the country and influenced much the literature. The literature was the combination of the pagan and Christian ages. St. Venerable the Beat and Anglo-Saxon Literature The Anglo-Saxons doubtless brought with them from the continent the root beginnings of poetry such as come first in the literature of every people and consist largely of brief magical charms and of rough popular ballads. English literature originates from Anglo-Saxon literature. It was probably called Saxon or Anglo-Saxon literature. By the time they conquered Britain, they had no written literature yet. The stories had to be memorized. At an early period, professional minstrels, called by the Anglo-Saxons scops or gleemen, disengaged themselves from the crowd and began to gain their living by wandering from village to village or tribe to tribe, chanting to the harp either the popular ballads or more formal poetry of their own composition. They sang of battles and exploits of the brave warriors. These songs were handed down orally to children and grandchildren from mouth to mouth. They had the letters called runes. They used runic alphabet, which they cut on wood. Among the most famous monks of that time were Cadman, Kinewulf, Al Queen, and of course the Venerable Bede. Their works were marked by the religious spirit. They wrote religious hymns, the description of the lives of the saints, the history of the people. The 8th century in English history is better known to us because of the writings of the Venerable St. Bede. If only for the words of his history of Saxon England, St. Bede's contribution to the world of knowledge would be formidable. He was esteemed as the most valuable contemporary historian of his time. However, his contributions extended to many other fields of knowledge, to mathematics, philosophy, music, and etc. Thus, in his own times, he was acclaimed as the most learned man, not only in England, but in all of Europe. 
This same claim was accorded him by the church when he was proclaimed doctor of the church by Pope Leo III in the late part of the 18th century. This was but the culmination of the honor and respect given him during the intervening thousand years. During his lifetime and throughout the Middle Ages, the Venerable Bede's reputation was based mainly on his scriptural commentaries, copies of which found their way to many of the monastic libraries of Western Europe. The method of the dating events from the time of the Incarnation or Christ's birth came into general use through the popularity of the historic Ecclesiastica and the two works on chronology. Bede's influence was perpetuated at home through the school founded at York by his pupil, Archbishop Edward of York, and was transmitted to the rest of Europe by Al Queen, who studied there before becoming master of Charlemagne's palace, School of Aachen. Bede's works fall into three groups, grammatical and scientific, scriptural commentary, and historical and biographical. In 731 and 732, Bede completed his Historia Ecclesiastica. Divided into five books, it recorded events in Britain from the raids by Julius Caesar to the arrival in Kent of St. Augustine of Canterbury. For his sources, he claimed the authority of ancient letters, the traditions of our forefathers, and his own knowledge of contemporary events. Bede's Historia Ecclesiastica leaves gap tantalizing to secular historians. Although overloaded with the miraculous, it is the work of a scholar anxious to access the accuracy of the, his resources and to record only what he regarded as trustworthy evidence. It remains an indispensable source for some of the facts and much of the feel of early Anglo-Saxon history. In 731 and 732, Bede completed his Historia Ecclesiastica. Divided into five books, it recorded events in Britain from the raids by Julius Caesar to the arrival in Kent of St. Augustine of Canterbury. For his sources, he claimed the authority of ancient letters, the traditions of our, of our forefathers, and his own knowledge of contemporary events. Bede's Historia Ecclesiastica leaves gaps tantalizing to secular historians. Although overloaded with the miraculous, it is the work of scholar anxious to assess the accuracy of his sources and to record only what he regarded as trustworthy evidence. It remains an indispensable source for some of the facts and much of the field of early Anglo-Saxon history. St. Bede was 62 years old when he died. The statue of St. Bede found in our parish center lobby represents him in the prime of his life. St. Bede's right hand is raised in blessing. He was a priest. The scroll represents his literary activity and the glove represents his historical scholarship. King Alfred the Great Besides those monks, it is necessary to mention King Alfred the Great, who translated the church history of Bede into Anglo-Saxon language, a part of the Bible, and wrote his own Anglo-Saxon chronicle, which may be called the history of England. Alfred the Great, King of Essex, a defender against Viking invasion and the social reformer, just few of the reasons why he is the only English monarch to be known as the Great. Alfred was born in 849 and served as King of Wessex, a Saxon kingdom based in the southwest of modern-day England, from 871 to his death on 26th of October 899 AD. In this time he ruled successfully over his Anglo-Saxon kingdom and emerged as a military force, a strong leader and a promoter of reforms. His most important achievement was to prevent an inland-wide invasion from the Danes and establish a united Anglo-Saxon culture. 
Alfred's reforms and ideas were applied to the education system developed during his reign. He placed much importance on translations from Latin to English in order to establish a wider array of books accessible for learning and intellectual pursuits. Furthermore, inspired by the example set by Charlemagne, he introduced court schools, a system providing a sound education not only for the nobility, but also those with less status. He ensured the best scholars who, who would teach in these schools with curricula dedicated to the li liberal arts. Alfred's keen intellectual disposition was evident in the way he chose to reform, develop and improve Anglo-Saxon society under his reign. On October 26, 899, Alfred died from unknown causes, most probably caused by poor health experienced early on his life. Alfred left behind an extraordinary legacy, reforming the traditions and structure of early English society, maintaining peace in uncertain times and introducing structure, judicial processes and education, which left a considerable cultural impact on the generation that followed. This is the end of our first lecture. At the end of the lecture, you are given questions to make self-checking and also a list of terms concerning this lecture.